know this pandemic, we've been restricted in different things we can't we can't go and Lord knows we need to do that because of this thing. But it's been such a blessing on Thursday. Look forward to sharing your word and talking to your people. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this medium. I mean, Zoom is a new thing, but man, I tell you, it's really great. And so God pray, bless our time together and allow us to continue to grow and to learn and to, well, just get closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so, you know, I want to talk to you a little briefly. It's so funny. Um, we were laughing a lot. and uh, But I, I really want to talk about joy. You know, uh, faith is a mindset and faith is a disposition, meaning that Faith is tied to the way that I am. My belief in God's word, the infusion of truth in my heart, because I am conscious of the spiritual reality of the way things are, I am infused with a sense of confidence a sense of assurity, certainty. I have a sense of utter, absolute contentment. God's word has that kind of effect on me in that it allows me to have something to believe in that gives me a sense of well-being that permeates my whole being. And, you know, we talk about being saved, right? And we talk about being saved from the perspective of being saved from sin and saved from eternal uh, destruction. Because, you know, when we are saved, we go to heaven. Okay? But I really believe that if you really look closely at the ministry of Jesus, Jesus portrayed salvation really having more to do with giving us a saved disposition. I know I keep saying the word disposition. I know that's not in the Bible, the word disposition. That's because there are a whole lot of words that portray a disposition. And we have talked about contentment and Lord knows, uh, <laughs> I'd like to do that again because as a believer, I'm saved from being dissatisfied. I'm saved from feeling unfulfilled. I'm saved from having desires that can't be fulfilled or having a hunger and having a sense of uh, lack or deficiency. I'm saved from all of that. That in Christ, I could literally feel Feel and have a disposition of contentment. I can say like Paul, whatever state I am, therewith I am content. Does that mean that uh, I have everything I could ever want or ever desire? No, no. Does that mean there aren't things that I need physically or, you know, mentally, whatever? No. What that means is I'm in a state where however things are right now, I'm cool, I'm satisfied. I don't need anything to make me feel satisfied. And uh, I'm completely at ease with the way things are. You see what well, some things in my life that are not the way they should be, and we're not true, but I've learned I've learned, it's something I had to learn that while God is doing things, while God's making things happen, I am completely confident. My faith allows me to be completely confident in the fact that he's got everything. He's got me especially, and I have nothing to feel deficient or lacking in. That's what, that was the first disposition. And then we talked about confidence. 
how that that is the disposition of a believer. We are to be confident. By confident means we are to have a, a way of thinking where we are assured and we are um, we are optimistic. We, we have a mindset where we know that God has got us. We know that God is taking care of things. God is in control of things. You know, we're not worried about how things are going to turn out. Not worried about what's going to happen. We're confident that our God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory, right? And so, uh, and then I was, and I was going from confidence to patience, but now I'm making a detour. I'm going to get to patience, right? But I'm making a detour because the Holy Ghost said, go over here. And I always follow the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is telling me about the disposition of joy. And I was talking a little bit about this in Bible study. And I want to expand some more on this because I want to suggest to you that God wants you to have a disposition of joy. When I say a disposition of joy, it's God's intention that you be jubilant. It's God's intention that you be uh, upbeat. You know, God intends for you to uh, be happy. <laughs> you know, that, that's God's intent for you is that uh, you have a, a way about you where you are literally um, happy-go-lucky, okay? You have joy. You have a uh, perception of, uh, of reality in a way about you. You're cheerful. You're elated. I mean, there is a uh, there's an inherent um, enthusiasm and inner sense of satisfaction, and you are always on the brink of a laugh. You know why? Because you're just aware of how good God is. You're just so conscious of how much he's blessed you. You're so aware of how secure you are in him. And the fact that, I mean, he loved you and he saved you. And uh, he's like, takes a lot of delight in you. And man, and, and when you walk with them, I mean, it just causes you to have this, as I said, jubilant cheerfulness about you. Now, this I said on Tuesday night that joy is the disposition, but the way that you achieve that disposition is one way. And that one way is rejoicing. Consequently, you have to incorporate as a general practice something that is just a part of the way you are. And that is that you engage in rejoicing. Rejoicing is defined as the act of expressing joy. Um, when you rejoice, the natural reaction of you rejoicing is that you conjure up joy inside you. You cause a wellspring of joy. You engage your faculties, your thinking, your inner faculties, your emotions, even your physical body gets involved with it. Rejoicing is the way in which you set the tone for your life. 
you determine how you're going to be by rejoicing, how you're going to assess your situation, how you're going to view your circumstances, how you're going to uh, assign your narrative, all comes from you making a decision that you are going to rejoice. I am going to conjure up joy. Now, one of the differences between us and unbelievers is believers react to situations and they have to wait around for something good to happen or for something to take place before they can ever have joy. That's why a lot of them go long stretches where they are just like not really having any joy, okay? Or even happiness for that matter. And that's because things aren't going right. Things aren't happening like they want. You know, they're getting disappointed. They're worried about something. And so they just kind of sit around and kind of hope and wait for something to boost them. Something. It's so funny how people say, you know, uh, Monday, Blue Monday, you know, and, and Tuesday, you know, and Wednesday's hump day. Got to get hump day. Oh, and then, then Thursday, that's the day before Friday. Then Friday, get paid, you know. Well, if you get paid every Friday, it might not get paid every Friday. But Friday's like the eagle flies on Friday, and so do I. Party, yeah. And then Saturday, yeah. And then Sunday they go, and then Blue Monday again. Tuesday, hump day, and that's the cycle. <laughs> and uh, but as believers, okay, we don't go through no ebbs and flows. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Notice I am in control of how much joy is inside me. Let me repeat that. You are responsible for how much joy you have because it is your responsibility to conjure up joy. So if you don't have joy, it's because you're not doing what you're supposed to do, okay? It would be a little easier if God would just zonk you. <laughs> if God could just zap you with joy, you know? Like I have everybody in church line up. Everybody line up in the front of church. I'm going to lay hands. You're going to get joy. You're going to get joy. I'm going to slap you in the top of your head. You're going to get joy. You know? But that's not how you get joy. You don't get joy from nobody laying hands on you. And you don't get joy by nothing zapping you or hitting you. And stop praying, Lord, I'm just waiting on you to give me joy. Lord, I just know you can do it. Lord, if you just give me joy in name Jesus. Stop that prayer. That prayer is not going to go anywhere. It's, it's that. Okay, you want to have joy, you have to rejoice, okay? And like I said, rejoicing is expressing joy, okay? That, that means that I literally, I give joy place in my life. I assign joy as a representative of what I am and what I think. You know, I'm, I decide that I'm going to be cheerful and uh, I'm going to, um, I'm going to make joy what I feel. I'm going to make joy lead and drive and motivate me. I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to set the tone for myself in terms of expressing joy. Now, I want to say this, that, you know, joy 
is the effect of my faith, okay? It's the disposition of faith, but my faith is what allows me to be able to rejoice because I rejoice because I believe in the truth. I believe in what God's word says is true about me. I am aware of what God's word says that God has done for me, what God's word says in terms of the privileged position that I presently am in, the fact, man, that I could be six foot under and the fact that I have made it by God's mercy and grace that I have been picked out, chosen, selected. I am the apple of his eye. I mean, so many instances where I should have been cut off, but God saw fit to bless me. And you know what? When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, <laughs> my reaction is joy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know? And, and, I, and I know I'm... Uh, People say, well, you know, you're just emotional. No, this is deeper than emotion. This is an act of my will. This is something I choose, I select. Consequently, um, there are times when I pull my emotions, I dictate to my emotions. I tell my emotions that, look, you're not going to dictate to me. I'm going to dictate to you. It's literally, you literally carry your emotions to where you need it to go, you know? I love what David says, you know, he says, why, so, he, he talking to himself, he said, he says, so, why art thou cast down? You know? He says, hope thou in God. He's like asking himself, why are you acting like this, man? Why, why are you down at dumb like this? He said, isn't your hope in God? Isn't he your expectation? And then he said, I will yet praise him. I mean, everybody should have a yet praise. That means it ain't got nothing to do with my physical circumstances. And, and I choose not to allow anything that's going on in my life and anything anybody has done to me or anything that didn't work out the way I want to dictate to me what my disposition is because I have a disposition of faith and I have a hope, expectation in God. And guess what? I rejoice. And, uh, you know, uh, let me see. I need to get to what I want to teach about today but because I got my notes. But, you know, the Bible says, count it all joy when you fall in the diamonds, trials and diamonds, temptations. You got to make a decision that I'm going to rejoice in this situation. Do you hear me? Wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life, I need you to rejoice. I need you to, I need you to decide I'm going to take joy. And you say, well, Pastor Day, this isn't going right. And this happened to me and I'm having problems with this. I'm not saying rejoice in your situation, your circumstance or something that's happening to you. I'm saying rejoice in the Lord. And if you are focused on God and you rejoice, there's always a reason and a basis to rejoice in him. It's not always a basis to rejoice in your finances or in your family situation. I'm not denying that some things could go on and happen. But when you rejoice in the Lord, you can always rejoice in the Lord. And I want to say flat out that your faith is measured by how much joy you have. Okay? Don't tell me you got faith and you don't have and you don't have uh, joy. And the reason why you don't have joy is because you flat out are not rejoicing. And I mean that literally. I mean, I know it might sound like I'm old some fine, but you got to decide I'm going to be joyful. And you got to tell yourself, look, um, this is the way I'm going to be. 
and I'm going to, I'm going to mentally, I'm going to exercise my mental faculties to think on the goodness of God. Think about all the reasons, all of the ways in which I am cheerful, jubilant. I'm excited. I'm grateful. Great. You know, I say rejoicing, but I'm going to tell you this. Rejoicing is tied to two things. Thanksgiving and praise. Okay? And that's something that you have to do all the time. I know it's hard to do it all the time, but I really mean it literally. That you are to be thankful, grateful all the time. And you have to just keep reminding yourself. You got to keep telling yourself. You have to keep making yourself aware of how fortunate you are, how blessed you are, how good God has been to you. I mean, you just got to think about that, okay? I mean, mentally, you have to think about that. And I'm going to tell you, the enemy wants you to focus on this and focus on that. But you got to like have a one track mind and that you are great. Your reaction, like when you wake up in the morning, don't get up in the morning and just let your mind wander. First thing you do when you wake up in the morning is say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. I mean, you just got to, you just got to set the tone for your day. And you got to say to yourself, you know what? I am just going to. I'm going to and you know, all throughout the day, okay? Because it ain't just a devotional thing in the morning. All throughout the day, just thanking God. Thank you, Lord. I mean, there's this dialogue where, and most of it is, Lord, I thank you. You know, you, you get it. And, and God, just, listen, if you like me, God's just doing stuff all day. Little things, big things, like you in traffic, right? And uh, you know, you kind of like need to get somewhere at a certain time, and you're in traffic, and you know, part of you is like, ah, man, you don't want to get stressed out. But you say, you know, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, I just thank you. And then all of a sudden, you look up, man, God says, okay, shoot. Then the cars move out of the way, and all of a sudden, you look up, and you, I was supposed to get here just, I got there on time. You're like, how did I do that when I was in traffic? That's just like a little ways God just does that. God does, just does little things for you and just blesses you, you know? It has you just uh, give you another reason to say, Lord, I thank you. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I personally believe that uh, you need appreciation, Okay. And uh, you get a warm feeling. I mean, it really boosts you when people thank you for things. When people tell you something that you did for them, or you know, you or they they like what the way you did something, you know, you. I mean, you might not show it, but you be like thinking inside, oh yeah, that that's, that's great, man. Thank, yeah, you know, it's the mercy of God, grace of God. But on the inside, you're like, yes. You know, because I mean, and it really is painful and disappointing when people don't appreciate you. You know, when you, know, you go out of your way for them, you do a lot of for them, and then they act like you ain't done nothing. You know, like as a parent, you know, it kind of hurts when your child, that, you know, you, all you do for the child, and the child act like, you know, doing something bad or you didn't. And they're like, man, you be like thinking, whoa, you know, I paid with your college education, and you're going to act like that. And it really kind of makes you kind of upset, you know. I mean, you keep your praise, your joy, and everything. Well, I'm just saying, that's just the way you are. All human beings need encouragement. All human beings need to be appreciated, okay? And if you don't have people that appreciate you, go find other people, okay? You got the wrong group of people around you. And that's a choice you have to make. Don't be around people who don't appreciate you, okay? And don't wait for them to appreciate you because they may not be capable of it. And you need it. You need a people who can appreciate. That's why I come to the church and let, let me appreciate you if you can't get nobody else. 
because it's really sad when you have to live without being appreciated because you need it. So I just say all that to say that God, because he loves you so much, because he cares for you so much, he wants to be appreciated. I mean, God wants you to thank him. He wants you to express your thanks to him. That makes him feel good. You know, there's, there's this, you say, well, does God need my, no, it's not, he doesn't need it because God doesn't need anything. But in terms of the love relationship between you and him and the vibes that can be exchanged, the closeness, the intimacy, the sense of his presence, his power, you know, that comes from your praise. That comes from your thanksgiving. You, your sense of him being consciously taking care of you. I'm telling you, you literally have this exhilarating feeling when you're in the presence of God. And his presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. And if and, and God is to be experienced. God is to be um, felt, okay? And our relationship with God is a passionate one. It's at the depths of our being, okay? This is not dead religion. This is a living, personal, heartfelt connection, okay? And God is all in me and I feel him. And a part of that exchange is that you are constantly engaged in the act of thanking him. Now, I'm going to tell you, you just like, like, like you listen right now. You just right where you stand right If you just start saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say hallelujah. Glory to God. You feel something. And you know what you feel? You feel God. You, you get a boost, all right? We, and when you see thanksgiving is to thank him for what he's done. Praise is to acknowledge him for who he is. And you need both of those. You need to thank him for what he's done because that lifts your sense of confidence in the fact that you feel loved, you feel appreciated, you feel favorite. You're like, whoa, God, I don't know if you've ever, like, somebody did something for you. I mean, they did something that where they went way out of their way. I mean, they did something that made you say, wow, you did this for me. And you're like shaking your head because you're like, you know, you mean to tell me you, you paid this much for me? You did that for me, you know? And that's why out of all the ways that God could have saved us, how did he choose? He, choose, he chose to die for us. Now, is there anything greater than the fact he died for me in terms of he spared not his own son, but deliver them up until us all. How shall he not with him freely? See, he did that to show us the extent to which he would love us so we'd have no doubt about anything he would do for us. And, and when you, when, when somebody dies for you, you're like, whoa, you did that for me? Wow, thank you. Thank you, God. And that makes you endeared to him. That makes you close to him. That makes you feel him. I mean, you just love him more than anyone else, anything else, okay? Because you're just grateful, you know? And then praise is what I, when I, when I focus on, on all that he is. That talks about his greatness, his power, his, his perfection, his glory, 
And I'm like, whoa, God, you are just like that. And I'm going to tell you this. God intentionally does things in your life to invoke thanksgiving and to invoke you with all of him. That's why certain things don't happen the normal way or the typical way. He has to, it's like he has to set you up so that you know it was him and you know that he did it for you and you know that only he could do it. Old folks say, can't nobody, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Nobody can do me like the Lord. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the way God wants you to be. He wants you to be engaged in thanksgiving and praise. Why? It's like I said, it makes you have a disposition of joy. You know, it makes you like rejoice. And I'm just telling you, it's your responsibility, okay? This is something you have to do. You have to rejoice. Whether, um, and, and it's all the time. I told you that Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. And David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In other words, I want praise and thanksgiving to be such a part of you that it literally is all the way down into your subconscious, right? So much so that sometimes when you're asleep, right, and you wake up out of your sleep, right, you say, I'm gonna shit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. You know, it's like it's just so all part of you, and you do it so much, it becomes a habit. It becomes something that is even unconscious. Praise is just a part of your inner being. Anything you keep doing and you do over and over again becomes a habit. Okay, it becomes habitual. It becomes internalized. It becomes something that you're not even thinking about. You know, especially like when we talk about being filled with the Holy Ghost and having your prayer language, right? And Paul said, when I pray in the spirit, my understanding is unfruitful, meaning that I'm not even conscious of what I'm saying. But my spirit is going past my mind and it's connecting to God and expressing that. And it's really good because I don't have to get slowed down by language. I don't have to get slowed down by thinking of what I'm going to say. It's just formed from my spirit, my innermost being to God. And it's like this. And you see, that's how I build up my most holy faith. They go have faith again. You know, pray in the Holy Ghost. That's Jude 20. Those of you are wondering what I'm talking about. Jude 20. It's probably about the only verse I know my heart in Jude. But <laughs> my point is, is that, you know, you ought to praise God all the time. And um, it's so funny because you know, I really believe that you know, if you do not praise God and if you do not thank God continually, you will have lapses, okay? You will give the enemy opportunity to um, get shots in on you. See, you can't even hear him when you're praising him. You can't hear the devil. When you're engaged in thanksgiving and praise, he could be talking to you and you don't even hear him. <laughs> it's so frustrating for him because he got to sit there. He's trying to tell you, you got to worry about something. He's trying to tell you that something bad going to happen to you. He's trying to tell you that somebody mad at you or that you messed up or you're a failure, you're going to lose. But every time he try to tell you, you so busy, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, glory to God. You don't hear him. He keeps trying to yell, whatever, and then finally he just has to sit there and wait till you finish. But the problem is, 
you never finish. <laughs> you just keep going on and on and on and on. And eventually, you know what he does? He says, shoot, let me move on to somebody else because I can't get nowhere with this one. I can't get him to focus on me. I can't get him to think about himself. I can't get him to worry about himself. All he want to do is just talk about Jesus. All he wants to do is give God praise. And you literally, you literally create spiritual commotion, right? You provoke angels. You're one of the reasons why we clap. That dispatches angels. You create a spiritual environment around you for miracles, signs, and wonders when you start to offer thanksgiving and praise. Well, that's what happened to Paul and Silas. They was in the middle of the thing, you know, and they started singing praise and worship. They started praising God. I don't know when they started, but if they got beat up during the day and they got thrown in there in the evening, they had to have been praising them from at least maybe, what, six o'clock? Seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. And the thing about praise is when you start praising it, right? <laughs> it starts to build momentum. You know, you actually become intoxicated with the Holy Ghost. The whole listen, the Holy Ghost just will like intoxicate you. You'll be drunk in the spirit. I'm serious, you know. That is just such a great feeling that all of us, well, not all of us, but some of us know what it's like to be drunk, okay? And I'm sorry to say that I have been drunk, okay? <laughs> not now. I'm saved. I'm a pastor. I don't, I don't get drunk no more. And say that people are saved, pastors, they do get, still get drunk. You shouldn't be getting drunk and you shouldn't be a later. Shouldn't be drinking. Keep y'all, keep your thing on there. Yeah, keep y'all mood on. Don't interrupt me. I'm talking about people being drunk. <laughs> but look, as whatever you was lit, you remember you used to say stuff like that. I was lit. I was tore up. Man, I don't even know who I was. Remember you used to brag about how drunk you was? Well, I'm gonna tell you something. Ain't no drunk like being drunk in the Holy Ghost. Man, let me tell you. And so at midnight, they had praised and worshiped God so much that they both built to a crescendo that something had to happen. And see, this is the amazing thing about praise and worship is when you praise God and everything, there's no record, no indication that Paul and Silas prayed that God will get them out of prison. There's no scripture. Then you look at that passage carefully. It does not say that they were praise and worship so that God could get them out of prison. They, they, they didn't ask to get out of prison. They weren't, they weren't, that wasn't even what they were thinking about. Okay. All they were thinking about is just giving God praise. And you know, they just started worshiping, right? Because, you know, if you just praise him and just give them thanksgiving and just focus on that and just get caught up in that, it won't even matter where you are. It won't even matter if you're in prison. And then things are happen for you that you didn't even pray for. You didn't even ask God to do. I mean, you know, he's like, I didn't even pray for that money. You know, I, I didn't even pray for that power. I didn't pray for that deliverance. He said, well, how'd you get that? Man, God just God just did it. I didn't. Have, so what were you doing? Praising God, thanking Him, giving Him glory, Hallelujah. And you know, I'll tell you this. I, I'm just speaking for myself. The greatest blessings God has done for my life, I didn't even know to ask for. I didn't. You know, it's like God just blessed me, and I wasn't even. And I, and I don't even think you should praise Him. So you're trying to get something from Him. It was just flatter me. You know, people flatter you so they can try to get you, you know, do something for them. But I think you just, just praise them because you just love to praise them. And you know that experience of just letting him know how much you appreciate. And so I guess what I'm saying is that 
the disposition of all believers is that we are to be cheerful. We are to be joyful. We are to be happy-go-lucky. We are to be optimistic. We are to be idealistic. Amen. Nothing gets us down. You know, it's like we are have a one. We have one mode, one mood. You know, moodiness is no longer acceptable. Okay, I don't have fits of depression and sadness, and, and I don't spend time feeling sorry for myself. I don't have pity parties anymore. Hey Amen. You know, sometimes the devil try to come up with something. I just stop praising him. I just stop thanking him. You know, and when the devil knows every time. He try to mess with you, you start praising him, he's going to definitely leave you alone because he don't want you to pray. And one thing he hates, one thing he does not want to hear about, because that's what he used to be. That's what he used to do. And so you got his job. I don't know if you ever had somebody take something that used to be yours. I mean, you know, it just burned. You burn. That's why he hates you so much. It's because you are doing what he was created to do and he lost it and then you got it. And he just gets so mad when he sees you praising. And so you, you just got to just keep on praising him and giving God glory because it's an honor. It's a privilege. Amen. And um, like I said, I just think the more spiritual you are, the more joy you have. And I think it's one of the greatest signs you got the Holy Ghost is that you have joy. I mean, a lot of people try to act like they're spiritual and they got the, they so full of God and they so sanctimonious, but they don't have no joy. They look all somber and it look like they swallow pickle juice and they got a nerve to say stuff like praise the Lord. It's the way you say praise the Lord. I'm sorry. You can't say praise the Lord in a way that's somber. The whole idea that you're praising God should lift your voice. I mean, put a little cheer in there because it is, you know? And um, I mean, I know it's great you speak in tongues, but if you speak in tongues and you speak in tongues in a way where it's just somber or not, and people say, well, that's my personality. I'm sorry. Well, you didn't change your personality because God is worthy. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, when the Bible says, let your light so shine, so they will glorify your Father in heaven, it's talking about you literally lighting up a room, releasing such jubilance and positive energy. You have a joyful glow about you, you know. Why? Because, like I said, you got faith. Faith is the belief and the trust in the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is that our God is an awesome God. That no weapon formed against me shall prosper. The truth is, amen, that the enemy will come up one way, will flee seven ways. That he's greater than all, and no man can pluck me from his hand. That is the truth. That's the true assessment. And what I am filled with that truth it affects my disposition. I am not worried. I'm not nervous. I'm not afraid. I'm not upset. It's so funny. The night, the election night, everybody thought the Trump had won. And I don't know anybody was more disappointed than me. I thought, oh no. I can't think about William Barr. Get that guy. No, we can't do four more years. And uh, I was telling uh, the, the school board me, I was telling her I was having trouble sleeping because I was like, thank God, how did you let this happen? I was like, God, I know you told me, you know, that you're faithful. And I said, I understand if it's your will, but please, Lord. <laughs> and God just, I'm, I'm really glad that happened because the Lord just spoke to me and he said to me, listen, what is the basis of your joy? I said, well, you, Lord, I mean, you gave me the teachings. He said, well, look, I want you to apply your teachings. I said, I want you to start thanking me. I said, well, I'm not really grateful about Trump being president. He said, you're not supposed to be focused on that. I said, rejoice in me. Because it don't matter who is the president. I'm still worthy to be praised. I said, oh, I get it. Let me stop thinking about that and think about him and focus on you. That's what rejoicing does. Rejoicing takes the focus 
off of you, off your circumstances, and puts the focus on God. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, a lot of people are going to really be surprised when they get to heaven, right? Everybody's going to be rejoicing. Everybody's going to be, you know, going around having joy. And they're going to be like, oh, man, you know? You got to practice for when you go to heaven, okay? A kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I need you to start acting like you're going to act in heaven. You don't need to get to heaven and then you got to just try to figure out and conform and change to be like the way it is. No, you make you you do it now. So when you get there, hey amen, it's almost like deja vu. You ever have deja vu? You ever like you do something like this? Man, it seems like I've been here before. I think I've done this before. It's like I've done this before. Well, that's the way, when you get to heaven, that's what you should, you should have that experience where you just like, man, this is like I was when I was in my bathroom now or one day. I felt this before, you know? You're like in heaven, like, man, this reminds me one time I was in church. I had this same feeling, <laughs> you know? And it's so sad because, you know, some of you used to really laugh when you were a sinner. I mean, you used to laugh when you, you used to be like life of party. You used to carry on, you know, before you were saved. I mean, before you came to the Lord. I mean, you was like, you was like the chief of sinners. See, some people are sinners. Some people are chief of sinners. <laughs> that means they let other people, they got other people going. People wait for you to arrive to the party because they knew when you got there, oh man, it's about to, it's on. He ain't here, she ain't here now. And it's sad because now you got the Lord, you ought to be carrying on worse. If you praised him before, not praise him, but if you acted like that when you was a sinner, Lord knows you can praise him now. Hallelujah. It's so funny. I was telling one time that I was in the barbershop and, um, uh, you know, the Bob said they had the television on and the price of right was on there, right? And you know how they call you and they say, come on down. Man, this one lady, this black lady, man, because can't nobody pray. Nobody can get excited like us. But we got it, we just got it natural. That lady was carrying on. She then he called her down there. She was just carrying on. And she carried on so much that it was almost like they had to wait for her to calm down so that they could, you know, ask her what the price of someone else. I remember sitting there thinking, lady, you ain't won nothing yet. I mean, you might not win nothing. I mean, you're excited just to be down here. You get all excited. Save some of that. Because, I mean, you might. And sometimes people, I feel so sorry for them. Because they go away empty-handed. They get zonked. And I thought to myself, if that lady could get that excited and she ain't won nothing, Lord knows we can get excited. When we have won something. <laughs> Let me get, okay, okay, I'm running out of time. Run out of time. Three things I want to tell you. First of all, rejoicing is the way that I go about dealing with trials. Now, let me just say this from the outset. Under no conditions. Are you to ever allow trials to stop you or interrupt you from rejoicing? The enemy says, okay, as soon as things get better, you can go back to rejoicing. But right now, I need you to focus on this. I need you to be sad for a while. I need you to be down for a while. I need you to worry for a while. I need you to be scared for a while because we got the situation we got to deal with. And uh, like I said, you can do that later. You can do that rejoicing there later, but right now, this ain't the time to rejoice. The devil is a liar. I rejoice in the midst of what's going on right now. And I make the decision that I am not going to focus on whatever is negative going on and whatever is happening in my life. I am going to 
thank you. I'm going to praise him. Lord, you are worthy. You know, I know sometimes you're around people and, you know, they don't understand this. They think, well, you're not serious. You know, you, you're not taking what's happening serious. You say, yes, I am. But this is the way I react. This is the way I deal with it. Okay? And I'm sorry if that offends you. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable. But listen, I'm not getting down. I'm not going in retreat. I am not beating up on myself. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I'm not engaging in doom and gloom. Despite my situation, I will yet praise. And the more severe, intense the situation gets, the more I will yet praise. Because this is how I deal with the. I, listen, I don't have no problem with the fact you want to cry, you want to feel sorry for yourself, you want to be mad. Look, that is your option. But as for me and my house, I am going to give God the praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you. I don't think I need to tell you all the reasons why you should be thanking him. Let me explain something to you. Today, 103,000 people got infected with that disease. 103,000. They're saying that with this spike, that in 10 days, 1 million people at that rate, new people, new cases of this corona pandemic, okay? I know you wear a mask. I know you wash your hands. I know you social distance. But of those 103, they probably, a lot of them, they were wearing a mask. They were social distancing. They were washing their hands. But God saw fit that you're sitting on this Zoom call and you are not infected with no coronavirus. Hallelujah. And even if you were infected, and maybe you have been infected, that's even more reason to thank him, more reason to praise him. Because this thing been going on since March. And guess what? You are still here. And let me, if you ain't got no other reason to praise him, praise him for that. Hallelujah. And you've been around some people that had the disease. They've been up close to you. Man, for a whole three months, four months, we didn't know we were supposed to wear masks. How is it you didn't get infected it ain't like the virus changed. It's the same virus. Hallelujah. They told you not to wear a mask because if you wore the mask, that would be somehow to make you put your hand on your face and then to make you. So they told you not to wear when, when they knew you should wear a mask. But guess what? Even though you didn't know, God was shielding you. His angels were protecting you. Man, don't get me started. Rejoice is the way I endure trials. Rejoicing is what allows me to keep my perspective. When I rejoice, that allows me to stay focused on the fact that all is good. And I got all these reasons to praise him. Rejoicing allows me to see beyond my circumstances and to see God and how God is working on my behalf. It's so important for you to be aware, uh, conscious of the fact you are a walking miracle and God has been better to you than you've been to yourself. When you rejoice, you keep that consciousness and awareness. You keep the focus on the goodness of the Lord and you become more aware of God than you do yourself or your situation. Not only that, but rejoicing sets your mental faculties in the state and the condition of celebration. 
The reason why we rejoice is because Jesus rose from the dead. That ain't Easter. That's every day. And he's at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. That he is king. Lord. He's my master. I'm celebrating. That he picked me out of the muck and the mire. That I am the apple of his eye. Amen. I'm celebrating his goodness. I have a faith disposition. You know, my time gone, but you know, I was reading something today about laughing, you know, because joy means you got to laugh. That means that you should laugh. Now, I want to tell you something. This is your homework assignment. Your homework assignment is I want you to laugh more. I mean, because when you laugh, there are physical changes that take place in you as a result of you laughing. They say that studies have indicated that we laugh less than our ancestors did 60 years ago. That one of the things that's, that our society does not have as much of is laughter. And um, it's funny because Laughter, 15 minutes a day, will prevent you from having a heart attack. Do you know that uh, laughter benefits you at the cellular level? There was this Japanese study that was conducted by a genesis, a geneticist, and he found that the stimulating effect of laughter is it creates energy within a person's DNA that could potentially make them capable of curing diseases. And I don't need to tell you that laughter boosts your immune system because it, it increases the number of virus killing cells, activating T cells and B cells to improve your overall immunity. Now, don't get me wrong. You should be taking elderberry. You should be taking vitamin D. You should be taking stuff to build up your new system. But let me tell you another thing that'll boost it. Laughing. All right? When you laugh, it literally causes those T cells and those B cells, amen, to increase inside you. <clears throat> and um, I'm trying to think what I, oh yeah laughing helps your cardiovascular system and it's the equivalent of a workout when you laugh it's the equivalent of you uh, burning a medium sized chocolate bar and I know you eat large but I'm just saying that you want to you want to lose weight you need to laugh more, okay? And uh, and it's real simple because we are equip equipped to laugh. Why? Because we have joy, and we just gotta think constantly of His goodness, His greatness. We just gotta praise Him, you know. And just gotta remind ourselves of how good God has been to us, because, like I said, it builds up your immune system. It strengthens your physical body. Laughter has been shown to reduce the levels of impendifrine and cortisol, which are the hormones that the body creates when you're under stress. And instead of crying, you start laughing. And that stress hormonal release starts to reduce. And you know those things are the things that cause your immune system weaken because there are excess toxins that eat away at your immune system. Next thing you know, you're sick, okay? But when you laugh, that builds up. And, um, you know, I wanna encourage you that, I want as a homework assignment, I need you to start laughing. 
Okay. And, and I mean, literally, I want you to uh, surround yourself with people that, uh, that laugh. Okay. If you don't have people in your life that laugh, it's time to find some people that laugh. Okay. All right. All these gloomy people. I mean, I'm not saying we mix some in your family. You know, you married to them. I mean, I'm not saying you get divorced or nothing. <laughs> but what I am saying is that, you know, this is, this is a part of your disposition is you laugh. And you laugh at yourself. Let me tell you this. If you can't find nothing to laugh about, laugh at yourself. You are comical. You do the funniest thing. Whenever you do something that is like, it should be funny. You should be laughing, be able to laugh at yourself, okay? Think about it. You repeat the same mistakes. You do the same thing over and over again. You like, you know, like me, for example, sometimes I say the wrong thing. I mean, because if you sit there and just get down and say you feel bad, but if you laugh about it, You'll find that you are one comical person. And um, like pain, Hal and Payne, they say that laughing it releases endorphins. It, it releases endorphins that allow you to manage pain. You know, instead of taking pain masks, get addicted to opioids. You got a you got an opioid in your body that's ready to be released to take care of pain. And uh, instead of being on drugs, get addicted to laughing. You know, smile. You know, they even said one study they gave. They said even when you fake laughing, it has a because your body, your mind doesn't know the difference, right? When you're faking and when you're real. You know, so when you start laughing, even when you ain't laughing or nothing, you just like, ha, 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 ha. your body reacts to that. Your body starts doing like releasing the cells and everything like that. So if you can't laugh at something funny, laugh, fake laugh, <coughs> you know, because God intended for you to have joy. Jesus said, I want you to have joy and I want your joy to be full. That is his intention. He said, these things I've spoken to you that your joy may be full. When he says full, he means complete. That means thoroughly, completely a part of your overall disposition. You are of a cheerful countenance. You are a person. And let me tell you something. There is nothing more attractive in witnessing to people than when they see you have joy, okay? They will not listen to you preach because you, you know, got articulation and you can explain things. That's not what gets them. What gets them is they're like, man, I want to I wanna be, I want to have as good time as you are. You, you think about it, when you were a sinner, the reason why you were a sinner, because you were just trying to have a good time. You didn't have no problem with God or the church or religion. She was like, look, I'm enjoying myself. People try to witness you. You're like, nah, man, I ain't ready for that, man. I'm trying to get drunk. I had fun. I'm trying to party. And you come up here talking about some church stuff. Nah, man, you know, that ain't the way to go. But how many have discovered, now that you got into God, you didn't realize this could be fun. I mean, is there any better feeling? Is there any more exhilarating feeling like worshiping and praising God? I mean, to have your entire being just feel exhilarated and excited. I mean, there's nothing I enjoy more than praising God. And at times, amen, when I'm literally just caught up in the glory of God, I could never get that from anything. The, the world cannot touch this. They can't come close to this. They can't feel this. They can't know this. We have it. It don't make no sense. And they are attracted to your joy. And they want to know. They say, you know what? I've been watching you. I mean, 
the boss be like carrying on and stuff be happening up in here. Be all in it. And it just seemed to me like, don't nothing bother you. I mean, you just come and act like you just give it. You act like you just happy. And everything. Then you hear what they said, what they doing now. And, and you got to tell them, let me explain something to you. This joy I had, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. And I want to tell you something. I'm not giving you a teaching so you can learn information. I'm giving you this teaching because it's time for your faith to be displayed in a deeper level of joy. I'm talking about something taking over you. Amen. Where you are consciously of a cheerful countenance. You hear me? It's time for your personality to go to another level of exuberance and excitement. Hallelujah. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm not that type of person. I'm a person that's very uh, unreserved and I'm not. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Given the right situation and the right circumstances, you would carry on like a crazy person. I'm going to tell you something. If I came to your house, gave you a million dollars, I defy you to tell me you would sit there and say, oh, thank you very much. That's really nice. You would get to hugging me. You'd be jumping all around. You'd be looking in disbelief. You would keep looking at the money or the envelope. You'd be calling up your friends. You'd be getting excited. I don't care how reserved you are, you would carry on. Well, Jesus saved you from sin and he filled you with the Holy Ghost. And he promised you whatever you ask in his name that he'll do for you. And you're going to sit up there and say, well, I'm not that kind of person. No. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, <laughs> That's why I'm gonna tell you something. I said, when we had church again, I'm talking when we get in the back in our building, like this virus is gone and all that, and we get back in church. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, okay? Okay, we are not having no three points in a poem, and we are not having no blessed quietness. We are not gonna be acting reserved. We are going to carry on like maniacs. We're going to give God praise. I mean, I've already decided I'm not wearing my best suit that Sunday. I'm going to wear a suit I don't care about. You know what? Because I'm going to be sweating through everything I have on. Because I'm going to praise him. I might not, y'all might not get much of a sermon that day. Might not be too much content because every other word is hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> well, my time's gone. I want to tell you something. I can't teach about a joyful disposition by just giving you teachings. This is something I got to act out for you. This is something, this is a spirit of something, okay? This is a way about you. And I want to suggest to you that God wants you to, he wants you to engage in the act of engendering or conjuring up joy within you based on the reality and on the truth of God's word. I want you to get the laughing. I want you to laugh, hallelujah, at every possible reason to give God glory. Do you understand me? I want you to turn it up to a point where it becomes your disposition. It becomes your habitual way of being. I wanted to get so deep in you, like I said, at night, you wake up in your sleep, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus, thank you, Lord. I'm talking about when you get up in the morning, the first thing out your mouth is, Lord, I will bless you today. Hallelujah. I want you to have such a spirit that you ain't even got to decide to praise. 
praise ushers up from your innermost being and comes up as a result of what is in your heart. Your heart is full of God and full of his word. And I mean, it's just a natural reaction. Matter of fact, when you complain, you feel different. Like, what in the world? Where that come? I don't, I don't do that. I'm not a complainer. I'm a praiser. When people come around you doubt, you actually, you actually feel that spirit. You're like, come around and you're no doubt. Uh, I'm not entering into that foolishness. I'm a praiser. And I engage in praise. And I have a disposition of joy. And uh, I'm offering thanksgiving and praise all the time. And I'm not saying you should avoid people, but don't let people, don't let people dampen your spirits, okay? Okay, don't let people take your joy. I mean, don't let people like, you know, make you feel like you, sh you, can't, you can't be joyful or that you gotta, you know, you're not being serious. Yeah, I told the lady, came me one time and said, I love your ministry, Pastor D. And I love, you know, your word. She it just bothers me because you'll be preaching and giving out that word. And then you get to laughing. You get to laughing. You see, you, you got to realize this is serious. There's souls involved. <laughs> I looked at her and just thought laughing at her. I said, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> are not going to stop me from laughing because you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. And it ain't about nothing but giving him praise. And uh, I'm sorry if I ain't serious enough for you. And I'm sure there's some serious pastors out there that you can go with them and be their little serious church. But I'm going to tell you something. This is such a joyful cheerful, jubilant. This is such an exciting, I mean, that God would pick me to deliver his word is laughable. It's laughable. It's laughable that I'm a pastor. <laughs> and I would never take myself too seriously to think I deserve to be here and I deserve to be doing this. Or that I got some special quality more than other people. That's laughable. Because I know what I was. And I know where God brought me from. And I know what I deserve. But God and the riches of his mercy is so fit. And you know what? I'm going to laugh my way all the way to heaven. And when you see me in heaven, I'm going to be laughing then too. <laughs> And with that, I'm done. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I want everybody in here on the count of three. I want you to break out into a laugh, okay? <laughs>